the biggest change in the Ham Radio UK license for a generation. We take a look at your comments, your views, and the background to this Ofcom document. A couple of days ago, we published a breaking news video about the Ofcom document that was going to be a generational change to the UK ham radio license. Quite some dramatic changes. And I got a lot of uh, feedback from you. And you can see the feedback from all the people that uh, watched the video and bothered to make comments below that video. An awful lot of comments. Surprisingly, a lot were in favour. There was a lot of comments and it's rather interesting to take a closer look at this document and how you view this document and perhaps a bit about the background. So let's, uh, let's have another look at this document and in particular your views, your comments and uh, how it may have all started. I think over the years, ham radio has become more and more complicated and more and more adventurous. And as it's developed, there's been a number of restrictions imposed upon ham radio operators in the UK. Some imposed, I suspect, by Ofcom, and I suspect that some have also been suggested and imposed by the RSGB. Dare I say that uh, perhaps a lot of old fogies that once thought uh, we should not do this and we should not do that, perhaps a breath of fresh air has blown through the RSGB and maybe through Ofcom as well, courtesy perhaps of Steve Thomas, the current general manager. Certainly the RSGB worked very closely with Ofcom and it's very easy to realise that this document, although published by Ofcom, was probably a joint venture. Some interesting facts, according to Ofcom, there's over 100,000 amateur UK licenses in circulation. That means to say that one in every 670 people in the UK are a licensed amateur operator. And less than 25% of the amateur population belong to the RSGB. Well, it's a bit distorted because I suspect a good number of those UK amateur radio licenses, although valid, are probably not in use. Now as to your views, well, it's quite surprising actually, or perhaps not so surprising, that many of you are very supportive across the board of all the changes. I mean, there's obviously some that have got some radical uh, views, but generally speaking, it was supportive. Now, I haven't edited any of the views in the previous video, and I won't do, I won't, I won't um, edit any of the comments in this video unless they are derogatory against a particular person, or for other reasons they, uh, they really shouldn't be published. But generally speaking, all the comments have been very fair, and although obviously some are positive and some are negative, they are comments that have some validity to them. Now I hope that the RSGB are going to um, make uh, it, uh, or at least, at least enable um, members and perhaps non-members to uh, actually view their comments. Interestingly enough, the Ofcom document invites you to make comments, but those comments are directed at Ofcom. Now I suspect that that may not be the most effective way of commenting because quite clearly the RSGB are the representative body of the ham radio population in the UK. And as such, to me it makes sense that any representation should be made to the RSGB who in turn can then talk to Ofcom about it. To make the comments and the representations to Ofcom, I'm not sure is going to be quite so effective. Because quite clearly, a lot of this information that has been acted on in the document has come from the RSGB. The RSGB have got much more data on ham radio, um, the requirements, the habits, what we do, what we don't do, what we'd like to do, than Ofcom can possibly have. So it makes sense to make your representation I would suggest to the RSGB. 
And Steve Thomas seems to be the leading light in this move, as you can see in that video. And after all, he is the general manager. And I've put a link below um, this video to um, the general manager's email address. Now, I purposely haven't put Steve Thomas's personal email <laughs> address. I'm not don't want to be that cruel, but there is the RSGB do publish a general manager's email address, and I suspect this is obviously um, managed not only by the general manager but by some of his staff as well. But I do hope that they will listen, and I hope that perhaps the RSGB will have some forums around the country. I don't know, but it is your one opportunity in a generation to make representation on your views about the future of the UK ham radio licence. Now there is mention in the document, very briefly, about a, uh, a fourth licence, in other words one below the foundation licence and uh, Ofcom in the document have said well no that's not going to happen and I guess that um, some uh, have, uh, have asked uh, the RSGB if we can have an even simpler licence I'm sure you've got views on that. Anyway, the foundation license is going to remain, the intermediate license is going to remain, and the full license is going to remain. And the big change, I suppose, for a lot of people is the power levels. The uh, uh, foundation license goes up to 20 watts, the intermediate goes up to 100 watts, and the full license goes up to 1000 watts. There was a couple of comments saying that um, the foundation license at 10 watts was the lower power than is allowed in CB. And I guess the reason for asking for an even simpler license is because on CB you can go on the air without a license. Well, it's one of these areas which you can debate for ages. But it's quite clear in this document that that's not going to happen. And I think even if you try to make representation, it will fall on stony ground. Largely, this document, I think, will be implemented. But there are ways that you can make representation and it possibly can be tweaked. I'm sure it can be tweaked and I'm sure it will be tweaked. Otherwise, why would you call it a discussion document if, in fact, it's not a discussion document? Now, the power levels are quite interesting, actually. And I think um, it, uh, in, the, in the video that I mentioned just now, the RSGB, they, they actually sort of didn't quite um, uh, cover the point um, as it should have been. The power levels, if you look at the license, and I'll, pub, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link below this video, it shows you the license conditions. The license conditions quite clearly say um, that the power levels are the peak power levels and they are the power levels at the antenna. That means to say, for example, that if, if you've got, let's say you've got, a, um, you've got a foundation license and your power level is 10 watts. Now, you can go onto the uh, website, internet rather, and you can, you can calculate what your loss is. You take a length of coax cable, you measure the length of coax cable you've got, and if there's, there's plenty of tables on uh, the internet which allow you to work out for a given frequency, a given VSW, or what your power loss is. Now let's supposing that you've got fairly long coax cable. You could conceivably say on 15 meters or 10 meters have a loss of 2 dB. That means to say that in order to actually have a power level of 10 watts at the antenna, you might have to increase your power to 15 watts. Yeah, an increase of 50% to, to regain the allowed power level at the antenna. So the important thing is that the power level is at the antenna. It's not what comes out of your transceiver, it's at the antenna. And of course that applies to um, the intermediate and the um, UK uh, full license. Now, let's suppose that you are a full license holder and it's quite conceivable with some of these big towers um, arrays that you have got a 2 dB loss. That means to say that you will need something like 1500 watts in order, or you can have 1500 watts in order to still be within the license regulations. So the 1000 watt limit is 
at the antenna, not at the transceiver. It shudders, isn't it? 1500 watts. Let's hope you're some distance from your neighbour. A number of um, uh, hams have commented on the fact that they don't think the power limits are high enough for the foundation license or the intermediate license. Well, let me tell you, I've been looking through some really old ham radio RSGB publications known as the Bulletin. This one is 1951 or 52, I think. And it's quite amazing the DX that has been worked at power levels of about 20, 25 watts. I mean, the idea of a high power linear then just didn't exist. In fact, there's an interesting article in there by G5RV who describes a power amplifier. A power amplifier that would give you, with luck, about 150 watts. And in those days, they used to describe power levels in inputs, not outputs. So, you can work DX with modest power. I, I regularly run 5 watts. The reason we need high power, unfortunately, is not so much because it enables us to work DX. It's because everybody else is running high power. And I really applaud those that run low power, particularly the QRP enthusiasts. And they have some spot frequencies, particularly on the CW era, and they do extremely well. And I work a lot of QRP stations, myself running five watts, and it's great fun. So the reason we are all running, not all, the reason that some of us run high power is because everybody else is. And that really is what part of this change in regulations is about. We actually don't need a thousand watts to work DX. We could work DX on 400 watts. We could work it on 100 watts in most cases. But if everybody else is running a thousand watts, we need to be competitive. Otherwise, we'd be squashed out. So that's the reason for the changes. You may agree, you may disagree. But I think, as regards to power levels, that is one of the changes that is going to come about, and it's almost cast in stone. Now we come to call signs, and I think it's fair to say that uh, we in the UK have fallen behind a bit with the likes of uh, some of the European countries and certainly America. A vanity call signs, I think, is the term that would be appropriate for it. We do it with uh, cars, don't we? Number plates. We can have vanity number plates. Um, and why not vanity call signs? Well, there's the, the, the area covering call side of the document is quite, quite a little bit complicated. You have to read it several times before you actually grasp it. And I think it will be tweaked a bit and perhaps made a bit clearer. But basically, in future, you'll be able to choose your call sign within certain uh, restrictions. You'll be able to choose your call sign. It looks as if you can choose your vanity call sign, and it looks as if you can have a two-letter call sign. And it also looks as if you don't have to have the full prefix. In other words, if you're a GM station in Scotland, you can actually leave out the M if you want to, and if you're a GD station, you can leave out the D, and the same for Wales, and the same for Ireland. Not sure why you'd want to, and it could cause some problems with with uh, the CDXCC, but it's your choice. But anyway, let's talk about the vanity calls. I think there's been a lot of uh, people that have been confused. I have actually been confused. Let me tell you, a, this is a true story. I was uh, once told by somebody that you couldn't get a two-letter call sign, and I believe that. But then I looked and I found that there was a number of two-letter call signs being issued in the last few years. There's one very high up member of the RSGB who has got a two-letter call sign. And there's other examples I found, all of which have been issued in recent times. So I thought, OK, well, I'm going to test this out. So I got in touch with Ofcom. And I got a standard reply. It ran to around about a full page of text. It was quite clearly just a standard reply, basically saying they don't issue two-letter call signs. So I challenged it and I said, look, 
this, these are the examples of course I'd have issued. And I waited and I got the same reply again. So I then wrote back to Ofcom and said, look, I'm not interested in having this standard reply. It's a simple question. You say I can't have a two letter call sign and yet quite clearly you've been issuing them. I got no reply and I waited for about nearly six months. So I sent them a reminder and the, re and the reply I got from the reminder was the same standard full page of text. So I gave up there. Um, now, the interesting thing is I had a conversation with a very high up member of staff of the RSGB and I said to them, look, I'd like a two letter call sign. And they said, you can have a two letter call sign. And they told me exactly what I needed to do. Unfortunately, it involved some level of deceit, which I wasn't prepared to go down. But it was interesting to learn that in actual fact, you can circumnavigate it if you choose to, shall I say, bend the truth a bit. Anyway, it now looks as if you can have your two letter call sign. You may have to wait a couple of years and it looks as if there's going to be a 20 pound cost involved in some of this. Actually, 20 pounds is not too bad. I mean, you know, as, as prices go these days, and bearing in mind that our license is free, a 20 pound cost is not too bad. So it'll be interesting to see how it pans out, how many two letter call signs pop up around the bands and how many people are uh, prepared to sacrifice that call they've had for the last 10, 20 or 30 years and they're known by to then pop up with the call sign that nobody's ever heard of for the last 50 years. But there we are, it's interesting. So that's the situation on call signs. Now, this document is quite complex and it needs a bit of reading. And I suggest you do read it thoroughly because uh, it takes a little bit of understanding in certain areas. But I think on, we, we must really congratulate the RSGB on the amount of work. They've obviously done a lot of work in this document and it covers a large area and it is a generational change. And I think by and large, a high proportion of ham radio operators like some of what's in there, if not all of what's in there. There are the exceptions, of course, that always will be. So in summary, I would encourage you to make your views known if you feel that you should make your views known. And if you think that things should be changed, then tell the people involved. And as I said earlier in this video, I can't see that going to Ofcom is going to be as effective as going to the RSGB, who after all are the official representation of a large body of ham radio in the UK. So it's your choice. It's an interesting choice. It's an interesting time. And you've got until I think it's the 5th of September to do that. So you've got a bit of time to ponder it, but don't leave it too late. In the meantime, you enjoy your ham radio. You enjoy the idea that you can increase your power if you want to. You can change your call sign if you want to. Oh, and you can't have more than one call sign. Well, why would you want more than one call sign? Thanks for watching this video. You take care, enjoy your ham radio. And it's been a very interesting read. The Ofcom document, discussion document. Don't forget, discussion document. You take care. Thanks for watching this video.